Thank you so much to Adam Ward. That was a wonderful opening for our time together. Welcome to the September General Meeting of Providence United Methodist Women. I am Carolyn Phillips, your current president, and I am thrilled to have you join us for our first gathering to be live streamed to you and your homes. It is a challenge right now for groups that typically meet in person to stay connected. And we plan to do that by continuing this format for our general meetings until we're able to meet in person again. Each of our eight circles will also make plans to stay connected, probably in by a Zoom meeting. We hope that these program adjustments will demonstrate how much we care for each one of you during this pandemic. If you are a visitor, I consider you a gift. The silver lining to the changes that we've had to make. I hope your interest will be piqued to discover what a special group of women this group is. Now I'd like to introduce Valerie Wilson, our spiritual growth coordinator, to provide a devotion to open our meeting. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to tell a story for our devotion this morning. In the summer of 1984, uh, our son Michael was four years old, our daughter Karen was two years old, and we drove from Cleveland to Baltimore to visit our grandparent, th their grandparents. And on the way home, we camped, and so the first place we stopped was Shenandoah National Forest and had a wonderful campsite there. And then we made our way down the beautiful Blue Ridge Parkway. The next day, we stopped in West Virginia, and I've always loved the name of the state park where we stayed, the Hungry Mother State Park. As we drove into our campsite, we passed a beautiful little swimming beach that they had created alongside the river there. And so once we got to the campsite, we set up the tent and we decided we would spend the rest of that afternoon swimming in the river. And so we loaded the kids back up in the car and went down to the parking lot there. Now, I don't know if you remember what it's like traveling with small children. It, there's never uh, just a little bit of stuff that you have to take. There were the towels and the beach blanket and the diaper bag and the cooler and, and the thing, of, you know, the bag of snacks and, and um, juice boxes and all of that. So both of us, David and I, were both pretty heavily laden uh, as we uh, made our way across the parking lot. I also tried to keep one, one finger down to hold on to the two-year-old, Karen, who was just toddling along at her normal slow pace. My eyes were watching the ground to make sure that we didn't trip and fall as we made our way down the sandy beach. I was hot, I was tired, I was distracted. But suddenly, I heard my son Michael say, look mommy, a Jesus cloud. My four-year-old was pointing to a cloud rising above the cliff on the other side of the river. I looked up and saw a beautiful white cloud in the shape of a figure with its arms outstretched as if in welcome. And as I gazed at the cloud, I felt my irritation and worries fall away. I was amazed at the connection my four-year-old son had made with the Sunday school lessons he had, had gone to and to this magnificent cloud figure silhouetted against the blue sky. And I was so grateful for the wisdom of a child who saw beauty and wonder around him. Today we live in troubled times. We find ourselves focused on a virus pandemic, divisive politics, and unrest in the streets. And it's easy for us to succumb to fear and worries 
that keep our eyes fixed on the ground, afraid that we will stumble and fall. But Jesus does not want us to feel burdened or afraid. Time and time again, he reminds us, do not be afraid. I will be with you. Look up, dear friends. Focus your eyes on Jesus. He is our peace. He is our comfort, our healing, and he is our salvation. Look up and praise the Lord. Let us be in prayer. Dear Jesus, we need you more than ever to show us the way to truth, life, and peace. Be with us today and always. Amen. Thank you, Valerie. That was wonderful. I'd like to quickly cover some business before we turn the mic over to our guest speaker. Having our general meeting live streamed has taken many hours of coordination and problem solving behind the scenes from Brandon Dirks, Carlos Canarte, Russ Case, and our volunteer cameraman, who today is Richard Dukes. And we are very grateful to all of these people for their time and their expertise. We voted this morning in our UMW board meeting to make a donation to the Sound and Technology Committee in honor of these gentlemen. We are determined to keep UMW connected during the COVID shutdown through our virtual meetings and continuation of our ministries. Now, our ministry of making sandwiches for the soup kitchen cannot be performed as usual in the church kitchen right now. So we, will, we still want to support this important mission, and we intend to keep delivering sandwiches every two weeks to the soup kitchen. Temporarily, we are asked to make the sandwiches in our homes and rendezvous in the church parking lot so that one person can carry them uptown. There'll be more information about this process provided to your circle chairpersons, and I have confidence that when it is your turn, you resourceful women will be quite willing to buy four loaves of bread and make 40 or 50 sandwiches in your home kitchen. To continue our longtime fundraiser that supports this particular endeavor, we're going to have the pecan sale this year by submitting our order forms and checks directly to Sue Spears, our fundraiser chair. The order forms will be emailed to Circle Chairs in mid-September for distribution. There will also be a link in the church newsletter and on the UNW page of the church website where you can access a copy of the form. You should complete the form and forward it to Sue Spears with a check for your total order by October 17th. When the orders arrive from the grower, we will inform you of a date for a drive-by pickup here at the church, or you may request that a volunteer deliver your order to your front porch. Harris Teeter won't have anything on us. But now realize there is no plan this year to purchase additional pecans to be sold later in person. So you need to get on the ball and pre-order and prepay. And it brings me great joy to announce that we are also planning a petite cookie walk this Christmas. We will be selling a limited variety of baked goods and crafts, things that are popular to all of you, through the use of an order form. There will not be any attic, attic sale goods or a silent auction. So all the cookie walk purchases must be pre-ordered and prepaid. Knowing that our proceeds may not reach the large amount of our typical donations to UMAR, the Haiti Mission Foundation, and Partners for New Hope Hospital, I hope that you will be moved to also make a monetary donation this year. These missions are near and dear to our hearts, and we want to continue to support them even during the COVID shutdown. 
There will be more information coming about this in the weeks ahead. Now to the fun part. Our speaker today, Reverend Brandon Dirks, is an ordained deacon in the United Methodist Church. He grew up near here in Hickory, North Carolina. He attended NC State University and earned an undergraduate degree in aerospace engineering. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't wait to hear what led him from aerospace engineering to the ministry. It must have been a very strong calling. Brandon attended Pfeiffer University for his master's in Christian education and the Methodist Theological School of Ohio for his ordination studies. He first served as a youth minister in Tennessee, and then after getting married, he and Katie moved to Wilkesboro, North Carolina, where he was a director of Christian education. He served at St. Stephen's Church here in Charlotte for 12 years, then at Christ Church in Louisville, Kentucky, before joining us in July. Brandon and Katie have two children, Kenzie, who is a freshman in college, and Baxter, who's a junior at Myers Park. Brandon enjoys running in his spare time. He has completed three marathons and a dozen half marathons, which will undoubtedly prepare him well for his work here at Providence. He also enjoys playing pickup basketball. So now I am going to pass the ball to him so you can see why I'm so excited to have him as a part of the Providence team. Thank you, Brandon. Oh, it's uh, my honor to be here. Thank you, Carolyn. It really is my honor uh, to be with you. Um, it would be great if you were here in the room with us, uh, but you know, the, given the times, I'm just so grateful that you're tuning in uh, right now. You could be doing anything else today but you've chosen to spend this little bit of time with us. And I just want to thank you for that. Uh, whenever I speak publicly, I usually like to start with a prayer. So are you okay with uh, praying with me? Let's pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. And Lord, I just pray that no one hears my words today because they are listening intently for your word. Amen. So, uh, as I understand it, uh, and I'm, I am honored, I am very honored to be here. It's uh, one of my first speaking engagements since I've uh, come back to North Carolina. Um, uh, as I understand it, uh, the purpose of this is so you all can get to know me a little bit better and, uh, and for me to share with you a little bit about who I am and what my role here is at Providence United Methodist. I'm very excited to be here. Um, it's been a long road to get here, but I do feel like I'm home. And I, and I just thank you for the hospitality I've gotten so far, and I really appreciate it. Um, and it's, it's been a great ride. But my story starts uh, not quite so happy. I was not what you would call a faithful kid. Uh, when I was growing up, I had a lot of issues with the church, mainly because my parents uh, made me go to church. They would pile us in the car. There was five of us. I was the middle of five kids. And they would make us go to the church, and oftentimes they would drop us off, and then they would go back home. Uh, and I, that always bothered me. I, I, uh, I, I, it just set a bad tone for me, I guess, uh, with me and the church. Um, and we only went occasionally. And so with that bad attitude that I had, I grew up as a person that really loved adventure. I always loved pushing boundaries. I love trying to do those things that, that people would say are impossible or you can't do. Um, and so I, I started just doing things just because I love to do them. Um, I would uh, volunteer at Vacation Bible School. I would uh, spend my summers volunteering at church camps and, and going on mission trips, and I joined scouting, and I even joined some public speaking contests when I was in the fourth grade. I volunteered uh, as a 15-year-old with Habitat for Humanity. I lied to them about my age so that I can go and help build houses. and. 
all of these things are just things I did because I wanted the adventure of life. Um, and yet, it was all mixed in with this church stuff, with this God thing. And I recognized that God might be tapping me on the shoulder for something even that early, but I fought the call. I didn't want to do it. I quit scouts. I got into trouble, a lot of trouble in high school. I, in college, I joined a fraternity, and I enrolled in engineering. I tried. I was a lot like Jonah in trying to escape that touch on my shoulder, even though I didn't really uh, fully understand it. I also had theological troubles with the whole concept of faith. Um, and, and I could sum it up in, like this. Um, do you remember the story where Jesus is in the garden uh, just before he, uh, his trial, just before he's crucified? He's in the garden and he's praying alone. And if you remember, he, the way I interpret it, he was asking God to not put him through the trial that was about to come. And I just didn't understand that. I didn't get that. After all, if he was God, why did he actively not want to do what his purpose was. And I really struggled with this divinity of Jesus and this humanity of Jesus um, for a lot of years. It just didn't make sense to me. I had people in my youth group when I was a teenager that would just love to argue with me about that kind of thing and would love to talk, but nobody could ever get through to me on, on my theological issues. And yet I still did the adventure life. And you know the adventure life is not always going to lead to someplace glorious. The adventure life can lead you into areas that are dark. And I did go into some dark places and I did some things that uh, I'm not very proud of. Um, got into some trouble in high school and college. But the whole time I really, looking back on it, I felt like I was escaping who I was meant to be. But it wasn't until a couple of events that happened in my college years that really woke me up to a few things. Uh, the first thing was when I was a college freshman. I came home that summer and I walked in the door and there on the, uh, on the kitchen floor was a big duffel bag. And my parents uh, were getting ready to go on yet another mission trip to this place called Mountaintop. Mountaintop, Tennessee. They had been going for years. Uh, they had been talking about it. They loved it. I had never been with them. And I was, you, you, know, you ever notice when somebody talks about something a lot uh, and they get excited about it, you sort of, or I sort of go, uh, I'm not interested in that any longer. I get kind of sick of it. Well, that's the way it was when I was a punk 19 year old in college. And, uh, but when I got home, or I got home from college, my, there was a bag on the floor, and I asked my parents, I said, what is that? Are you guys going to Mountaintop? They said, yeah, we're going to Mountaintop tomorrow, and you're going with us. I was livid. I had planned on doing a summer of my own thing, of my own adventure, um, but they made me go on this mission trip. This mission trip, um, if you're not familiar with Mountaintop, you take a, you go with a youth group. We've got some youth and adults. You go to the um, you go to a place in Tennessee. You go to a camp with other youth groups, and then you divide into groups of like four or five teenagers with a couple of adults, and then you're sent out as a work team to go and do some minor home repair. I happened to get on a team out there with no one I knew. There were youth from all over the country. There were adults from other churches, and I happened to get on a team where I didn't know anybody. During that week, we were given an assignment of a house to work on by the name, the guy's name there was Willie. And I remember this distinctly. As we were driving up to his house, and no disrespect, but this is the kind of house that you kind of smelled before you saw. And when you got to the yard, uh, it was overgrown with overgrown weeds, and there were, um, you know, tires in the yard. There was trash in the yard. Um, it was a it was a trailer at the time. And we go and knock on the door, and Willie comes out. Willie uh, was 
older, at least he looked older. He had his head shaved a lot like mine is, but he had little prickly hairs coming out of it. And I remember distinctly the prickly hairs that he had coming out of his chin, uh, coming out of his chin. I remember his teeth were brown, the few teeth that he had were brown from tobacco juice, and then there was the tobacco juice uh, line running down his chin. He was really gaunt, he was really thin, and he was embarrassed to have us at his house. He didn't want us to come in. Our assignment was to come in and do some repair work on a floor, but he was embarrassed uh, to have us there. So we just kind of stood there, and we sat and talked with him, and and got to know him a little bit and eventually he warmed up to us and let the work crew go in but for some reason I stayed out on that porch and I started having a conversation with him about his life and and remember I'm 19 years old I'm not a trained missionary I'm just talking to fellow human being and I asked him some questions like um, you know uh, what's life like here in the Appalachia mountains or in the Cumberland mountains and he would tell me that it was very lonely he said that the only time he ever had visitors was when mountaintop would come and they would send a crew to his house once a year and they would spend just a few days there he said oh occasionally somebody up the road would come in and bring him a a pie or something but he never had any friendships or relationships his family was all dead or gone and he was just so lonely that stuck with me Um, And I didn't know how to respond to that as a 19-year-old. But something happened that night. We got back to the camp, and at the camp is about 100 of us, and and every night they would do a sharing time where people kind of share about their day. And one by one, different youth and teenagers and different, different adults would stand up, and they would talk about this great project they're working on. They're building this deck, or they're moving this outhouse. Yes, in those days we were moving outhouses. Um... And I was, there was this feeling inside of me that just was, it was burning inside of me. It was like an anger that was burning up inside of me, and I couldn't stand it any longer, and I stood up. And I didn't even know what I was about to say, but I stood up, and I said something like this. I said, you know, the stories that I'm hearing, you know, we're all just really patting ourselves on our back and about how good we are that we came out here to this camp and we're helping these people but guess what we're going to get back in our vans in a couple of days and we're going to drive back home and we're going to go back to our homes with air conditioning with full pantries with plenty to eat and we're going to go on with our lives but i want you to know that i met willie and willie stays here he will be here this week he'll be here next week he'll be here 52 weeks out of the year and he'll be lonely You know, we come here for one week, and we pat ourselves on the back, and then we leave. Who's going to be here for Willie? And tears were in my eyes, not the crying kind of tears, but the hot anger kind of tears. And then I sat down. Uh, Little did I know what that would do to change me. Later on, a a staff member came up to me and asked me to consider joining the staff of Mountaintop next year. And guess what? Two years later, I did. I ended up, it ended up turn, make a turning point for me to take missions a little bit more seriously, not because of the program, but because of the people that were affected. So that was one big event that happened to me uh, when I was in, in college. Uh, the other part was when I graduated from college. Um, Again, I had not taken seriously the call. I was a typical college student. I only went to church so I could play on their church softball team or when I had a date and I wanted to impress the girl I was dating. You know what I'm talking about. But when I started getting towards my senior year, I had worked for Mountaintop for a couple of summers. Um, But in my senior year, you know, when you start to fill out your resume and you start to send it out to uh, different uh, different businesses so you can get a job and I was still an engineering major I wanted to work for NASA I I wanted to be a pilot I wanted to be on the space shuttle I also wanted to design engines so I created my resume or intended to create my resume for NASA and for Pratt & Whitney two two of the major players in the space uh, program Uh, but as I was filling out my resume something really amazing occurred 
You know, when you list on your resume, you list your job responsibility or you, you list your um, uh, jobs that you've had. Well, I, I didn't have a lot of engineering jobs. I had a lot of vacation Bible school jobs. I had a lot of uh, working at church camps, uh, working at Mountaintop. And then there's that place on your resume, you know, where you put your volunteer hours and what you do volunteer and everything was really just about everything was right around doing things for other people mission trips to Mexico mission trips to Appalachia um, uh, things like that Um, then it dawned on me as I looked at my resume my life was naturally being led in this direction but I was trying to force it into an engineering direction. And you know what? I never sent those resumes. Never sent them. I crumpled it up, threw them away. I packed up my car from Raleigh at NC State. I drove to Hickory down I-40 to see my parents for a couple of days, and then I kept on driving to Tennessee because that was the place I experienced that some that first inkling that God was in my life and I just had to be there I began to realize that my anger that I had that at that first mountaintop trip my anger originally was directed at the church to be honest with you because my experience of the church was so negative at growing up I was upset that I had to find God outside the church I had to leave the church to find God touching my life I had to be out there where people were where people were hungry or tired or poor housing or whatever that's where I experienced God and I was angry because the one place where you're supposed to find God I couldn't the church that's when I realized what God's call in my life was God said to me, not so many words, but I picked up on it. He goes, all right, Brandon, if you're going to complain about it, I want you to fix it. He called me into the ministry at that point to be in a church, to lead them into what God's call is out into the world. So that's kind of my call story a little bit. There's, a, there's more to that. I got a lot of validations around that. There's more and more stories around that. But that's kind of the root of my call. My call, my root of my call is in mission work. And it must be through the church. They go hand in hand. They're together. So that's a little bit about my story. I can, I can go on and on about that, but I know that you're probably bored by now and probably thinking about making a sandwich for lunch, and, and that's okay. Um, but I've come now to Providence, and it's really kind of neat, this full circle of my original story with Mountaintop. And now uh, I've, I'm traveling around to different churches, the Providence being my sixth church, and I'm here now as the missions director, as the missions minister here at Providence. I couldn't be more excited. Uh, I've been reliving and rethinking my call story so much since coming here, getting back kind of to the roots. And it's really kind of exciting because every time I talk about missions around at at this church with different people, there's lights that go on in people's eyes. There's an excitement here about the difference this church is doing in our community. Now, I'm still learning. I've got a lot still to learn here. Um, the impact and the motion of this church. Um, But already, I'm just telling, I I can tell that this church gets the relationship between the church, what the church does inside the building, makes a big impact on what the church does outside the building. So I couldn't be more thankful to be here. So I wanted to share with you a little bit about my philosophy of mission, Um, my theology of mission, if you will. Uh, most of you all know the great commandment from uh, Mark 12, um, 28 through 31, where Jesus basically says that the great commandment is to love God uh, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and to love others as yourselves. That, to me, is at the very core of what we are as the church. 
there is a vertical component that we as a church are to learn how to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's hard to do. You know, have you loving with all of who you are. So the church is here to help you to be able to love God with all that you are. But also there's a horizontal component. There's an outward component of loving others. And the way I've always interpreted that scripture is you can't have one without the other. You can't love God without loving others. And you can't love others unless you really love God. There's a both and in there. And I've often met people who are just so focused on one component to the detriment of others. You know, they're focused on, I'm all about loving God, and I'm going to be at church every time the church doors open. I'm in three small groups, um, and I'm at the church all the time. And they're really focused on their daily devotions and reading the Bible, and they're very biblically knowledgeable. But you don't see any impact in their life in the lives of others. You don't see personality differences. But then also I see it on the other side. I see people who are just so gung-ho with helping people and being out there making a difference, and yet there's something lacking in their spirit because they haven't met the great relationship to have with Jesus Christ that is transformative of our heart, that makes our mission work transformational in the lives of others. Oh, sure, it can make a difference, but what we're looking for is transformation. So the root of my um, the root of my theology, I guess, or philosophy of mission is that discipleship is at the core of missions. I say that again. Discipleship is at the core of missions. In other words, the great commandment goes hand in hand with the great commission. Go and make disciples. Uh, They're two sides of the same coin. You can't just peel off the head of a quarter and call that a quarter. You can't just have the tails. You've got to have both. It's the head. So the discipleship piece is an important thing is an important piece. So therefore, I believe that every disciple should be in a small group. Everybody should be in a small group, uh, helping each other discover and grow closer and become and develop a relationship with the Lord. But it's also a place to disciple and to train the person so that they can go out into the world. So not only should every disciple should be in a small group, But every small group should be about helping those disciples to be in service to the world as an extension of God's love. So what you're going to hear from me a lot in my time here is I'm going to be encouraging people to get in small groups. Now, that may sound like I'm not behind missions, but how much more effective will our mission work be if we have growing, mature, maturing disciples of Jesus Christ? You know, we're about the transformation of the world. We're about helping God bring God's kingdom into this world. And we need kingdom builders to do that. So there's a both and in there. So you're going to be hearing me that if you're not in a small group, uh, let me help you get in one. And if you're already in a small group, keep going with it. But if you're in a small group and not attending, then why not? There's a both and. I love the United Methodist women because they're so focused on this both and. You know, United Methodist women has a great reputation for missions. And why is that? Because they're so dedicated to their circles. You see, the both and is needed. So that's the first uh, point on my theology or philosophy of missions. The second one is missions is at the heart of the great co-mission. You know, that, that uh, statement that Jesus made to his disciples right before he ascended, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded, and lo, I will be with you always. Our ultimate mission is to go and make disciples. That's our ultimate mission, to go and make disciples. The church is not a charity. Although we do charitable work, our ultimate mission is to make disciples, make ourselves into disciples, and to help others become disciples. So therefore, I see the church as a training ground, that the church is the training ground to send out 
people who can make disciples. So think of it this way, uh, a three-legged milk stool. Have you ever seen one of those? You got the stool, you got the three legs. I believe that the church should be about three main things, worship, discipleship, and missions. Worship, discipleship, and missions. Worship is what inspires us. Discipleship is what trains us. And missions is what sends us. All three are necessary for that stool to stand upright. You take one of those away, the stool is useless. Now, I've seen useless churches. I've seen useless churches that are more focused on worship than the other two. That leg is fatter and longer than missions and discipleship. Or they're more interested in missions than they are in worship and discipleship. And that leg gets fatter and longer than others. But it's ineffective unless all three are working together. That's just part of my philosophy when it comes to mission work. Worship inspires us. Discipleship trains us. Missions sends us. And I believe, third, that every disciple, every follower of Christ, if you're watching this, I'm talking to you, every one of you is a missionary. Yep, a missionary. And what do I mean by missionary? I want to share with you a scripture that not many people fully understand. They've heard this before, but they don't fully understand. It comes from Philippians um, chapter 3. Verse 20, and it goes like this. Uh, I'm going I'm to share with you a, a few verses before. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is shame. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven. That means we are citizens of heaven. That means we're sent here as missionaries on this earth. Does that make sense? We are all missionaries. Now, don't take that too far in saying that I'm telling you that you have to, you know, give your life to going to Africa or to Egypt or wherever to be a missionary. What I mean by that is we are all sent. We are all sent. And until we get a good understanding of ourselves as missionaries, we're not going to be helping God as much with building God's kingdom where we are. So let me talk to you a little bit about that. How were you sent? Well, Jesus said in John 20 that he's sending his disciples in the same way that his God sent him. What was Jesus' mission when he came? Jesus was sent to redeem the world. Jesus was sent to redeem the world. And so we share in his mission message We share in his mission to spread the word of redemption. So everywhere we go, we are talking and we're helping people understand that God is about redeeming this world. Like Jesus, we bring God's message. We are charged to bring it accurately and clearly and with the power of the Holy Spirit. We were sent in the same way Jesus was. Where are you sent? Where are you already? Could it be that God has given you a certain set of gifts, certain set of callings, certain relationships, because he wants you in a certain place in this world? That's your mission field. I'll put it like this. One of the great examples I've tried to communicate to churches I've served is I I would often be in meetings like mission meetings and things like that, and I would ask them, I said, who are the children's ministers uh, in our church, and and you know they would mention you know the the paid staff person you know who is doing the children's work or even their assistant, and they might even say some of the volunteers who teach Sunday school and things like that. And I say you're absolutely right. Have you got them all? 
and they look at me strangely, which is not unusual. I'm often looked at strangely. But they look at me strangely, and I said, you know, one, er one group of people I think we may be neglecting is our public school teachers. And they were like, how can a public school teacher be a children's minister? And I just help put it in context for them. Think about it like that, this. If we have public school teachers that are attending our church, every single day they are really going to a place where God and religion and faith is not allowed to be talked about. And yet they're going to be with students for eight hours a day roughly. Who has a great Im opportunity to make an impact for Jesus Christ in the lives of those kids in the, that setting of the school? Our job as the church is to train those children's ministers how to be missionaries in that environment. That's just one example. You know, we have many people here who are bankers. What if God has placed you in that place of that bank or in that office to be a missionary for Jesus Christ? Our job as a church is to train you and help you be successful at that. Every disciple is a missionary, and we need to claim that. So that's kind of my philosophy of missions uh, a little bit. Uh, I, I want to share with you a little bit about my excitement about what's going on missions here at uh, Providence. I love the work that you all have already done. I love how it is uh, laid out there for the whole congregation to get involved in in whatever way they can feel gifted. Not everybody has to do everything. Uh, I love how you guys are, uh, I guess I should say we, how you guys, now that I'm on the team, how we are uh, living out Acts 1-8, that, that, that second call story to the disciples to go... Um, and spread the word and be disciples, uh, be my witnesses uh, here in Jerusalem, here in Judea, and around the world. There's this call to this local mission, to this regional mission, and to worldwide mission. And Providence has embraced it all. I love the five pillars of your local missions around uh, the Charlotte Rescue Mission. Um, dealing with the addictions. The addictions are the killers in our society, the silent killers. But it's more than that. There are people who are addicted, who have addictions that may not be involved in this. They're functional alcoholics in our society, or they're addicted to other types of things other than substances. Um, I love the commitment of this church to deal with the problem of addictions. I love that we are focusing on roof above in our attempt to make a difference with homelessness. I love that we're involved with Freedom School uh, that uh, and what's next and with Oakhurst that this idea of impacting the lives of our children and not just children that we don't know but our neighborhood children that are just down the street from us. I love these five pillars of missions of local missions but I also love our regional missions with UMCOR and our youth missions which I'm, I'm proud to announce that they are going to be doing their pumpkin sale pumpkin patch this year so I hope you come and support them uh, disaster relief um, that we still work with also I love that we have this uh, great opportunity with St. John's and St. John's is a uh, um, a neighboring campus that Randy and I are working closely on, and Randy's got a great vision for that um, as well. And I love our international missions. Um, the longstanding history of, of the Haiti and the way we want to empower the people of Haiti, um, and we're not just coming in as on our white horses like we are the know-it-alls and we know what's best for people, but we go into partnership and go into relationships uh, and share um, lives together that way. I love that we're involved with Rise Against Hunger. Did you know that Rise Against Hunger right now um, is 22 million meals behind what they normally do for feeding people worldwide? 22 million because COVID has, has eliminated their ability to elicit groups to help pack food. Um, those are 22 million people that are used to getting regular meals that are no longer. 
but we are committed to helping that in that area. We have missionaries, and we and then Zoe empowers. Now there are many things on here that I'm still learning more about, and I'm excited to be about. It, but I couldn't be more excited than uh, to join this church in their passion to experiencing God in this place being trained as a disciple and go out into the world as a missionary to make an impact um, so that's really kind of a, a big broad kind of where I am on on my role here primarily it's around missions but I also have a, another primary role and and that's with supervision of our contemporary service um, the contemporary service um, is uh, a challenge right now because everything has got to be done over the internet but one of the things that we're doing I wanted to let you know about is I'm so excited that this church sees the value of both contemporary and traditional uh, worship because you know Jesus said a long time ago if you remember the story of the woman at the well um, one of the issues that the Samaritan woman at the well had is the Samaritans believed that worship on Mount Gerizim was the right way to worship while the the um, Jews believed that worshiping on Mount Moriah, which is where Jerusalem is, was the right way to worship. So the Samaritans and the Jews, although they are basically cousins of each other, um, ethnically they're cousins of each other, there was this animosity between them. But Jesus comes in and says something amazing he doesn't acknowledge either type of worship as the right way but he says this that um, God desires us to worship in spirit and truth God desires for us to worship in spirit and truth spirit is that divine place inside of us that wants to respond to God's touch in our life. And truth is based on the character and nature of God. And what I really like about Providence's two-prong approach here, at least two-prong approach here, is that we recognize that people engage their spirit with the truth of who God is in different kinds of ways. And I love that Providence has this holistic view. Um, Randy and I were talking about this um, you know, ever since I started uh, coming here, this idea of this holistic view that we're one congregation, one people called Providence United Methodist Church who happens to worship in a variety of ways because we want to help people discover the God that loves them so much that touches that divine spark in them that will lead them into a path of faith that will lead them into ministry and mission work in the world. We have one message each Sunday where we have a preacher that comes in each Sunday and, and it's the same message that the traditional service gets that the contemporary service gets because we're one people. And at the core of it all is our emphasis on being unified as one people. So I'm learning. I'm figuring this whole thing out. And I'm excited to be here. I hope I've given you enough about who I am and my history, my role here as missions minister, my role here as, as director of the um, contemporary service, the NET, um, that maybe you have questions. And I would love for you to feel free to email me, to call me. Uh, I, if you're comfortable, uh, we can meet over Zoom or, or a, a well-distanced coffee. Um, but I hope... I've generated some interest among you all to, to see that even though the church building may be closed, the church is not closed. We're still at work. Now, I'm going to invite Carolyn uh, to come up here. She's, she might have some questions. I want to give a time for some Q&A here. So I'm going to step off here, and, and she may have some questions for me, and, and I'll do my best to try to answer them. Um, Brandon, um, UMW has typically in the past tried to support and mesh in with the church's mission of the month. Do you plan to continue the mission of the month? 
I, I think the mission of the month is uh, is a great way to help people get connected to it. So yes, I do plan on connecting to it, uh, and we're trying to figure that out now. We've got a few things already planned. You may have already been involved in the Oker Steam Academy Mission Month, and if you've noticed, we it, we blew it out of the water with our relationship with them. So this this coming month in September, we're having some trouble trying to get that going. So we may be kicking off the mission of the month starting in October, where we want to engage with Roof Above and how can we help that situation. And in November, Rise Against Hunger. In December, we want to get behind the uh, Christmas Eve offering and we want to get behind some of the other missions that are going on. And we want to help people find their mission. So. So December may be a little bit unique in saying that we want to help you find yours through what we're already doing in the church. So the short answer is yes, but it's not all the way defined yet. Well, we all love um, a love story. So can you tell us a little bit about Katie and how you met Well, um, it's it's fascinating. I'm glad I told you the story story about Mountaintop. But uh, Katie actually was on staff at Mountaintop. My first year I was on staff at Mountaintop. And it would be more fascinating if she came in and told you the story because when we first met each other, we did not get along. We, we were not get along. My leadership style clashed with her leadership style. We were on the same team, and we were uh, we argued over every kind of thing. Uh, we didn't get along, but it was really interesting that as a being a part of that community for for three months of the summer, um, we became friends. Uh, we became best friends. In fact, I set her up with my roommate so that they could start dating and and that kind of thing. Um, it was years after we met before we even considered starting to date. Um, and when we started dating, it's, it's like the perfect fit. We're two best friends. We didn't have to go through that weird dating time of, you know, I got to put my best face forward and my best attitude forward and all that kind of She already knew all that stuff, and she still wanted to be around me. Um, so um, that's kind of how that all got started. She was a uh, youth minister as well. Uh, once we got out of Mountaintop and got out of college, she was a youth minister at Bethlehem United Methodist in Nashville. I was a youth minister at Springfield United Methodist Church in North Nashville. And uh, when we decided to get married, after about dating for two or three years, um, one of our priorities was that we would worship together. And that meant that um, one of us had to consider not being in the ministry any longer. And I said, which one of us? And she quickly volunteered. She had she had been serving as a youth minister and evangelism minister for about six years, and she was done with that sort of church life. Um, so she gave up her, her her current career at that time, and I felt like I owed her as much. So I uh, resigned from that church so that we could start over together at a brand new church you know sometimes when a minister comes to the church it's really easy for people to get to know the minister but the but the uh, spouse is often in the background they'll they'll know Katie my wife as oh that's Brandon's wife instead of knowing her as Katie so um, if she were to have come to my church that I was already serving that would have exacerbated that so we decided to start together our ministry together, and that's how we got from Nashville to um, to Wilkesboro, North Carolina. I don't know. Is that is that enough? <laughs> yes, and now we'll look forward to hearing Katie's side of that story. Totally but um, okay, we have just a couple of minutes for one more question. How do you um, intend to keep the net membership? those of us in the contemporary worship. Um, how do you plan to keep the net membership engaged during the shutdown? Uh, that's probably a lot longer uh, answer than just a couple of minutes. But I will say this, um, as I think about our, our people, and I'm not just talking about people who attend the net regularly or who attend the traditional worship regularly. As I think about and as I've been talking with people, a lot of us are out there and we're feeling alone. 
we're feeling lonely we're feeling disconnected we long to be back one thing that the coronavirus has done is maybe it has reminded us of what's really important in this life and that's our relationships with one another we long to be in relationship with each other but I think there's also this growing sense this longing to reconnect to the Lord with others we do the best we can over this internet kind of thing but there is something special there's something powerful when you're with others so the best that we can do during this time in my opinion right now is we want to give them something they can connect to so we uh, we've decided to re relaunch i guess the contemporary service in back in wolf hall so that when people tie into the contemporary service they see something that's familiar to them a lot like the traditional people when they tie in to the traditional service they see a familiar space um, we are putting uh, parts of the band back together as best as we can so that when people tie in to the contemporary service, they see people that they're familiar with. And we're singing songs that they're familiar with. Um, Randy, their senior pastor, is bringing the message um, most of the time. It's someone they're familiar with. They don't know me very well, but I'm, I'm inching in there a little bit. But our goal is to help people feel as connected to one another as possible so that when we do relaunch the uh, in-person worship then the joy that will fill the room because people are back in a place that they're familiar with so that's kind of our short-term approach with that the other part uh, of helping people feel connected is is that I'm trying to reach out to the people who um uh, are generally attending that service. I'm trying to have coffees with them, phone calls, Zoom meetings, and things like that. I'm going to be teaching a, um, a, s- uh, a short-term class with anybody from the net that's interested in being a part of it. This way they can get to know me a little bit. Um, and we're going to have to do that over Zoom. Um, who knows when the in-person worship um, or on-premises kind of things will happen, but it does it takes all of us desire to stay connected to one another as best as we can Um, I don't know if that's the best answer I can give you but I've only been here two months and I'm still figuring it out and the best way I can figure out how to do this is I've got to meet people and and if you're watching this and and you're somebody that uh, wants to feel connected and you want to meet with me reach out reach out help me because I don't know who to reach out to yet (laughs) Is it? So I guess uh, I, let, me, let me close by saying this. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity, Carolyn and Valerie. Thank you, uh, United Methodist Women, for what you do, for your passion for discipleship, for your passion for missions. I think you and I are going to make great partners. Thank you very much, Brandon. I am so happy that we've been able to connect digitally with you today. I hope our program has encouraged you to reach out to others and to lift lift each other up through prayer, a phone call, an email, or a text. Brandon has told us that we are missionaries and we need to support each other. A virus will not be able to disrupt the UMW fellowship and love that we have for each other. Normally, if we were together in person, we'd be getting ready to enjoy a wonderful lunch in the annex, and we would join hands and sing our closing hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. So wherever you are now, Imagine what it would feel like to be here in this chapel, standing in a circle surrounded by friends of all ages, and listen as I recite our closing. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is light to that above. Amen. Thank you very much for joining us today, and we hope to see you on October the 6th when we will have a speaker from Dahlia Grove talking to us about 
their mission support of um, women who have been subjected to um, to difficult things in life, and she will explore all that with us. Thank you very much. Goodbye.